Good evening from Phoenix, Arizona. Your man on the ground, Macasia Jackson, with the JFK Report. We have a great show lined up for tonight in about a few minutes. I'm going to sit down with Kyle Clifton to discuss a mistrial of Tony Navarrete, the former Arizona State Senator, for alleged uh, molesting his two nephews. We'll talk about the mistrial and whatnot. And other than that, I'm going to bring on American Grayson, the founder of Pure Politics. It's going to be a great discussion. Let's have a good night tonight. Welcome back, guys. If you're trying to get some work done for editing, doing some video work, content, sports podcasts maybe, media, news, a commercial, Hub TV USA here in Phoenix, Arizona. If you're trying to get some work in like that, please DM. Oh, my Twitter's back, so you can find me on Twitter at the JFK Report if you're trying to get in with Hub TV USA. Hey, guys. Welcome back. Macasia Jackson, your host for the JFK Report. Next to me, I got Kyle Clifton. Last week, we talked about Tony Navarrete, former Arizona state senator. We peacefully confronted him and asked him some questions about allegedly molesting his two nephews. Well, the other day, which was yesterday or maybe Tuesday, breaking news, there was a hung jury, a mistrial, and the Maricopa County's attorney's office does not know if they're going to go through another trial. We didn't discuss this last week on the episode of what we would think would happen in the trial. You know, we were going to, I talked about how justice is going to kind of serve out, but I'm kind of not shocked it's a mistrial. I mean, are you shocked it's a mistrial? No, I think we predicted it. If I recall correctly, I, I think we actually predicted that it was going to be a mistrial. I mean, the jury system nowadays, I mean, there was tons and tons of evidence against Navarrete. And, and uh, I mean, of course, the jury found a uh, jury ended up could not coming to an agreement. Yeah, it makes you wonder how many were trying to say guilty, and it could have been a couple, maybe a few more than a couple that would say, no, I'm not saying guilty. It really makes you wonder, you know, especially when they said the most hard evidence was that voicemail. And it makes you wonder, too, if the nephews testified or if they were kind of scared and were kind of, you know, not open to speak up about it or they just kind of changed their mind. But I don't want to get too much into it. The court will handle it. Um, it's a mistrial. But hopefully we don't see this guy in politics anymore. This is still going to leave a bad reputation on his name. You know, just as, either if he, it's allegedly, so I can't say he did it, but even if he did or not, it's going to be up to God to judge him and decide. But he he knows what he did or what he didn't do. So other than that, I appreciate you guys. This is Kyle Clifton. Kyle, if you want to give out where they can follow you at, that'd be nice. Yeah, guys, if you want to check out, I do a lot of undercover journalism, uh, a lot of investigative work, um, broken a lot of news, a uh, lo lot, lot of local news also, uh, if you're here in Arizona. You can find me on Twitter. It's uh, Kyle Undercover. Uh, you can find me on Telegram as well, Kyle AZ. All right, thank you, Kyle. God bless. Welcome back to another night in Phoenix, Arizona. Next to me, I got... American Grayson of Pure Politics. You got to follow him on Telegram and Twitter. Get at my boy. He knows everything politics. True American patriot. I'm glad to have you here, man. Thanks for having me on. Oh, yeah, always, man. It's glad to always have you on. Okay, let's get to it, man. You lived in China for, what, five years? Yes, a uh, little, little bit over five years. So you were living in China at the end of Obama, and you got here near the end of Trump getting out of office. Yeah, during the Obama administration, there was a big problem with jobs. So I started looking abroad. I had a college education, pretty much multiple languages, and mm -hmm. China was hiring. So I went over there, and the Trump campaign started up like right after I got into China. And I was like, this is, this is pretty awesome. It's pretty amazing. And worked there for, for a little over five years, came back to America in 2020 when the whole COVID thing blew up. Yeah. So let's do a circle right now of kind of what's going on in America with men our age where it's you know we're, we're being told go get a job go find a job go buy a house but you look at the research you know you were, we were just talking about the other day we can't even afford to get a house and we could apply, you know, I just applied for 15 jobs. I know if we talked privately, he said, I've been applying for jobs everywhere. No one's just calling us back. We both have great resume. We have college degrees. I have the veteran background and no calls. Like, what do you think about that when you actually, and you, and you told me this too, you go back to China right now and go find work. Oh, yeah, 100%. I already have job offers from a bunch of companies in China. 
And I think that a lot of the stuff going on in America is affirmative action and overdrive. We've seen the job support come out where over a million white men have not returned to the workforce pre-COVID. And every single other ethnic group has hundreds of thousands of more representation within companies. So these companies are not hiring the best. They're hiring based on what you look like, the color of your skin or your gender or sexual orientation. It's affecting America in a very negative way. And you're seeing a lot of men who are not the right color, who are not the right gender, because I guess you can change your gender now, right? <laughs> and they're putting in these resumes, hundreds of them, if not thousands, all over different places. They're highly experienced. They have the education and they're just not getting hired. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that because I've applied just recently for other jobs can't even get a call back it's just nothing and the biggest you know one of the arguments i always hear from people you know it say uh you go down to the migrant workers where they're picking fruits and vegetables where a regular white guy won't do that or some regular american guy he's not going to go pick fruit for ten dollars and i told him you've never been to montana or the midwest where high school teenagers are working on the farm for anywhere from five to ten dollars an hour bailing hay or driving combines i'm telling you people if people need a job they would do that job but they don't offer it to the people they give it to people that they pay them less and undocumented and it just hurts us even more it's one of those arguments i, I cannot stand to hear oh yeah the the massive immigrant situation is causing a lot of the wages to go down and a lot of the jobs to be harder to find but um well trump did say that we preside over the largest amount of legal immigration in the history of america but besides that i think there is actually a silver lining this law of opportunity our american history has always been full of entrepreneurs people who set out and make their own way yeah and since world war ii the entire idea of how men approach the job market has shifted from being create your own work hard have something of yourself to working for somebody else and that's abnormal for American history. What we're seeing here is an opportunity to return to normal American work fashion of where we can be our own entrepreneurs. We can set our own work out in front of us to achieve things that we want to put out there. So say we want to start a company, start a business. We probably have not had the education from school to do so because they don't educate people in that way anymore. But with the, the factors at hand pushing all of these different people into into a way they have to find something that works. I think that we are going to go into a new type of economy with a lot more entrepreneurship, even though it looks dark right now. Oh, you're always going to go through the darkness. I mean, when you read the Bible, I mean, there's always darkness. You got to go through the pain first and the misery, and you see the light is part of life, man. It's the <laughs> cycle. So, you know, let's get your, we're both college educated, and we've talked about this privately too, about there's a lot of conservatives out there and a lot of people in Congress and just your basic conservatives, student loan forgiveness, they hate it. They hate it. They're like, we're oh, not doing that. That's a generational problem, oh, actually. I, I know. Yeah. So right here, we just had breaking news. The House passed the Israel funding bill that would give $14.3 billion to Israel paid by a billion, uh, $14.3 billion cuts to the IRS. So if we've already gave billions to Ukraine, and we're probably going to give billions to Israel, that billions of dollars right there could have paid off our student loan forgiveness. And maybe you agree or disagree, but I can't. A lot of conservatives complain about, because we know many conservatives are in college debt. We know they are. If the government says they're going to pay for it and they're giving billions already to other countries, you should just take it. They're already giving billions away. If they have billions to give away to other countries, pay off my student loan. I mean, what's your kind of your thoughts on that? Well, that's why this is a generational divide between. The younger generation, the older generation, it's not as clear-cut as conservative and liberal, Republican, or yep. Democrat. It's uh, the older people and the younger people. The younger people see an economy of where the GDP is being dwarfed by the interest payments that we have to make on our national debt. The national debt now to pay the interest is more every single year than to pay for our entire military. And that, that's pretty extreme. Compared to the older generation, with, which grew up in a very prosperous America, oh, yeah. of the national debt was solvable. That money did have more value than that. You could you could work a regular labor job and still have access to buying a home. It's a very different world which they grew up in and that they perceive America to be. So when young people see student loan forgiveness, they push it to this background of the national debt, the GDP, money has lost value within their li their short life, because younger people have had shorter experiences. They, they say, well, why can't the government pay off my student loan? 
and it's not conservative or liberal. They're saying the government prints money for no reason at all. Yep. They have massive debt, and they still keep printing out money and giving it to people who don't deserve it. Why can't they pay for my student loan as well? I mean, it's all monopoly money at this point. Yeah, and, you know, did you hear those arguments? Well, what did you do to deserve it? You know, like myself, I had the VA uh, GI Bill, but, I mean, it is what it is. I appreciate it, but I, I'm pretty much on you with it. You know, it's like you're giving all these billions of dollars to overseas countries, which is not America first. It's America last. And there's many pro-America first people in college debt where that money is like, it's paid off. You're already printing it. What's it do? With har- it's not hard. It- you're harming us more, giving us money to overseas the wars. That's just going to get our young men killed. And it makes you wonder about the military, too, about leadership just being destroyed and how men just want to go in the military and go to these foreign war countries. No, I just don't believe it. It's, it's well, yeah, yeah. I think I think a lot of men do want to join the military. The military is cool. You do a lot of cool stuff. I'm, yeah. I mean, it's pretty badass. But you look at the generals that we have, like Mark Milley, and then we have a bunch of transgender generals as well. You don't join the military to be pushing social justice and like crazy liberal propaganda. No. You join the military to be a badass. Uh, one of my friends, when he was joining the Marine Corps, said he's joining because he wants to blow stuff up. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, it's, <laughs> not, like it's not a very right deep now. thing. <laughs> I mean, they want to serve their country. Men are very selfless. Yeah. But they also want to do epic and awesome things. They don't, they don't want to have any of this horrible, like dressing up in a dress and putting makeup on and... Uh, shilling for other countries they don't want to have any of that they want to serve with their brothers they want to build a fraternal bond with them and they want to have a lot of fun doing it they don't want to go around and murder brown people either they want to have something that's that's just that's something that's justice for them and i know a lot of people might disagree with me on the uh, the world war ii situation but when america went to war with that there was a lot of justice in their minds that they were putting something right in the world are, are there any wars now that we can even like compare like to the bare minimum to something like that. I, no. I don't even think Iraq, Iraq veterans come back and they're, they say like, this is not a just war. No. I don't know what I did. Why, why did my friends die over there? No. And I actually have a brother-in-law from uh, Baghdad. He's actually a Christian and there, his mom and his aunt worked for Saddam Hussein. They cleaned his house. And it's funny. His aunt spanked his son, but she was vacuuming the carpet and he stepped on it over there. That's kind of their culture. She spanked, he spanked his son, and he ran off, and that was it. And it's funny to hear it. Not, not even funny. It's just interesting. He said, yeah, man, he uh, he respected the Christians. He took care of us. My mom worked for him. He knew me. My aunt worked for him. It was very peaceful. Then when the Americans came over there, everything just all hell broke loose. He said, yeah, we had the, the radical jihads over there, but they weren't really causing a problem to us yet. It wasn't until America got involved when everything just, just – our whole city got destroyed and all Iraq just – collapsed oh yeah president trump said this in the uh when he was running for president in 2015 2016 of where we don't like saddam hussein he's not a good guy but he killed terrorists he's one of the best at killing terrorists why oh, yeah. why did we overthrow that and turn it into what it is today yeah we can we can look at the fruits of the labor of the iraq invasion and our entire occupation there it was not good it made everything worse oh yeah and now let's get to your you know you were talking about the military and unity and young men trying to find a purpose how do we bring that as a nation where we could finally f- find that cohesion and unity as America first and Christians and get back to where what we should be on what the founders wanted originally? It's a rediscovery of masculinity. I think men need to get out of their comfort space and make more friends. They need to go out into the real world and have relationships. You can't be playing video games in your room. You can't be live streaming the whole time. You got to go out into the real world. You got to meet people you don't know. You got to be uncomfortable. Yeah, you got to get into some fights, A lot man. of, well, <laughs> probably not that far, but <laughs> <laughs> but to, to round it out, pretty much almost all the problems, the, the national debt, the perception of paying student loans, uh, the people not being proud of their country, the, the – uh, not liking the military, all of that revolves around this attack on masculinity and men in America of where you say, oh, you can be a man, you can cry, you can dress up in a dress, you can do this. This isn't masculinity, it's destruction of it. Instead, we should be saying to young men, you can, you can have um, tough friends, you can, they're going to bully you, you're going to get beat up sometimes, maybe you'll beat somebody else up. But at the end of the day, you don't hate these people because they're your friends. I and mean, that's part of what it is being a man. There's an inherent violence to our biology that 
a lot of women don't understand. And when you have a father, they take that energy, which is violent energy, yeah. and they put it into something productive. That's why instead you see a lot of men that are building buildings, putting into engineering, math, science. Yeah, they, They're doing the dirty jobs, like uh, cleaning out the sewers, uh, micro dirty jobs. He's a oh, yeah. very good yep. example yeah. of that. And all of that stems from the very base of the, the violence biology, because that's an energy, and it gets directed into something positive. We have we have a lot of women and a lot of sissy men who are, don't understand that, and they say instead of promoting this energy into something positive that builds our civilization, has built our entire history, let's just eliminate it because it's toxic masculinity. So in order to solve all these problems, we need to rediscover what it is to be a man, masculinity, and promote men to go outside and make more friends. It's really that simple. Oh yeah, and make that starts with bowing down to God and where it all started from. Yeah, man came from God and woman came from the rib of man. Now, to wrap this up right here, you know, you were just talking about masculinity and men and cohesion. From the research you and I were doing, about what is it, like 16% of Generation Z doesn't, no, yeah, 16% of uh, Generation Z loves America and the rest of whatever, like 74% of Generation Z just dislikes America and hates America, whatever you want to call it. Even though I'm not Generation Z, I'm a... Yeah, I might be out either way, I don't care. I, I, I love America, but at the same time, I highly dislike America because of how men are being treated, the economy, you know, they're come, what the government's saying about white people and what they're pushing against anti-white criteria in schools and whatnot. So how are we supposed to love America if they're just going to, if they're throwing us in the gutter? So I can't be upset about most of Generation Z not loving America. I mean, what do you think? I think I, th I don't think the answer to that question is as simple as loving America or not loving America. I think if you talk to most young men, most Americans who live here, and you ask them that question of, do you want to live anywhere else other than America? They're going to say no. Oh, they I'm want to live no. here. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you ask them, like, do you love your family? Do you... Do you love your community that you live in? Do you love the um, the things that you have access to here? They're going to say yes. And loving America, the way they phrase that question, I, I think I would like to look at it. But when when you think about stuff like that, you think, well, what, what are American values? I look at the military. It's a bunch of crazy sexual gender ideology. You know, I, yeah. I look at uh, public education. It's a bunch of foreign worship and anti-white racism. You know, and, and you can go down the whole checklist. When people have those things in their mind, of course they're not proud of what American values represent today. But you ask them about, like, what they are, what their American values are, they'll tell you they are proud of it. They're proud of our American history. They're proud of the Civil War. Robert E. Lee was a great American, and he's being tarnished by a lot of people who don't understand his relationship in America. So was Ulysses S. Grant, great American. Yep. These, these are points in our history that we should be proud of. We should be taught to be proud of them. And I think President Trump was bringing a lot of that back. He had that great speech in front of the uh, Mount Rushmore. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was one of his best speeches. Uh, I think that was the 4th of July. Yeah, and it, the reason why it was so good is because he did bring up our American history and he did talk about our American heroes in a positive way, something that a lot of Generation Z has never heard in their lifetime in their public education yep. or through media. And when uh, you talk about America positively and our American history positively, people are proud to be American. Oh, well, yeah. Amen, brother. That's that's for sure. All right, guys. This is American Grayson. Grayson, if you want to tell them where they can follow you. and yeah. Oh, yeah. Check me out on Twitter, American Grayson, G-R-E-Y-S-O-N. We got some hot takes over there. And I'm doing work with Kyle and MJ. We're going to be doing some work. So yep. good undercover stuff coming. Oh, yeah. And, guys, my Twitter's back. Thank you, Elon. He personally approved it. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, we wish. But you can No, get... he did. You you won't send the email, but uh, I know. Oh, yeah. Praise Elon. But you can follow me at the JFK Report. I'm back, baby. Get on my Twitter. Follow my Instagram, Telegram. I appreciate you guys tuning in tonight. God bless. Follow Jesus Christ. Get to church. Raise a family. Good night. <laughs>